we're happy to be hosting Sharon Ross, who's the QED program manager and perhaps other program managers at this point at the Science Center. Sharon's been with the Science Center since 2017 and has a very um, long background in tech transfer. And actually Sharon and I got to work together as part of the Energy Innovation Hub at the Navy Yard. So that's how I know Sharon. So she's been involved in some really neat um, projects and commercialization opportunities um, throughout the city and region. And today she's here to talk about the QED Proof of Concept program, which is a program that provides grant funding to faculty around early stage research. And Penn has um, a long history of participation in the program. It's competitive across the region. Um, so I think Sharon's on her roadshow for the upcoming um, deadline. Well, um, and thank you, Lori. That was a really great introduction. I appreciate that. Yes, it's been a, a long history with, um, with Penn for the QED program. And the QED program itself has a very long history. And, uh, and Penn has been with us since the very beginning. So um, yeah, this is our 14th round of the program that we'll be we're going into. It started in uh, 2009. So first I'd like to start a little bit, just talk a little bit about the University City Science Center. Uh, uh, I, I don't think a lot of people understand about the Science Center, but we are all, we're sort of all about um, uh, commercialization programs and moving technology to the marketplace. So um, we've been doing that for quite some time. Um, we have several programs around the uh, around commercialization. So uh, the Science Center itself, we're over on at 3675 Market Street, and we are owned by 31 university and research institutions. And Penn is certainly included in that. Um, we are the largest U.S. urban research park um, and a source of one in every 100 jobs in the region. So uh, our organizations are. Uh, looking to uh, generate th over 13 billion of, of economic output for the region. So um, the programs that we have that are centered on uh, commercialization, and especially for towards universities, uh, again, it's the proof of concept, this QED proof of concept program, which I'm gonna talk about today, which is for uh, very early stage life science and healthcare technologies and it's business development support. Um, and then the potential uh, out of the cohort that we have for up to three of the projects to receive funding um, and to prove out their proof of concept plan. Uh, another one of our partners is, and, and a member of our board now, is uh, CSL Bearing. Um, uh, CSL is the third largest biotech company in the world, and they uh, have partnered with us to uh, find technologies that fit their therapeutic areas of interest. And they are providing up to four hundred thousand dollars of funding over two years. And if you're interested in the in the CSL uh, program, they are actually we're right at the uh, part of uh, collecting new technologies for them, and they've actually extended their deadline. So if there is any interest, uh, I can send that out after this meeting. Uh, we're also a partner with BARDA, which is uh, the um, Health Security. It's Department of Homeland Security's. Um, uh, drive for health security on a national basis, and BARDA provides uh, under certain topic headings up to four hundred or seven hundred forty-nine thousand dollars for technologies addressing national health security threats. Currently, of course, they're looking at COVID uh, technologies, and they also have a special emphasis on sepsis technologies. So, again, any any of these things uh, uh, of interest, please please let me know. We also have every Thursday is our Venture Cafe. It's a now, of course, a virtual program, but it's entrepreneurial networking and topics. So they span all kinds of things from um, how to how to get capital, how to how to work with intellectual property, how to apply for grants, how uh, things of interest to uh, people trying to start their entrepreneurial business. And uh, I think it's worthwhile to check out uh, that and that along with our quorum program, which is a uh, dropping community event space uh, for, again, with an emphasis on um, startups. And again, co coffee and capital, something we do in the mornings, on usually on Tuesday mornings. If you go to the sciencecenter.org website, you can see these and you can sign up for our, our newsletter. And so I'm encouraging you to do that because uh, there's a lot of good information there. 
So uh, let's talk about the QED program. Um, QED is the, it provides, again, business development support, and that's in, in terms of uh, mentorship. So it's a uh, annual competitive program where we provide mentors to help you uh, come up with a proof of concept plan, which is basically a roadmap for you to move your early stage life science or healthcare technology uh, towards the marketplace. And it's open to uh, selected universities and institutions in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. And again, um, Penn's been with us for quite some time. So each year, uh, right now, we're, we're, we're in the um, application phase, or we'll be in the application phase, and I'll give you those dates. But we look for a cohort of uh, 10 to 12 projects. And those 10 to 12 projects get selected from all the applications we receive. Um, and they are, the selection process is done by a team of uh, usually venture, a lot, lot of venture capital people, people from uh, large pharma, small pharma, from uh, medical device technology industry, um, but lots of, of our selection team members who have been with us for a long time looking for technologies with good potential. Um, the proof of concept plan is a, a confidential plan once it's developed and it's uh, your plan and you'll present that then to the um, cohort uh, at the end of the year we select our awardees up to three awardees to get selected uh, up to two hundred thousand dollars each is the award amount and but that two hundred thousand dollars each is uh, contributed equally from the science center and from from Penn and we'll talk about that too uh, the key dates for the application process this year is um, it, um, the early application deadline for feedback, which means we accept your application and we actually give you some feedback notes, which are it's done internally from the Science Center. That feedback you can incorporate into the actual uh, deadline date of May 12th, which is the final deadline for applications. Application forms come to us through your technology transfer office. You do not apply directly to uh, to me or to the QED program, um, our we work specifically with the tech transfer offices to receive the, the applications. Application form is uh, asking a lot of the same kinds of questions that you would get asked on an SBIR or other market uh, facing grant programs. What do you envision your uh, product would be, or what's going to be created from your technology, and who would use the product? You know what. Uh, more specifically, who would pay for that product in the marketplace? If so, uh, and that may be a little bit different than who uses it, but you know, we are interested in, in figuring out if, if there is a uh, appetite for that technology to be paid for in the, in the marketplace. What current products does your technology disrupt or display? So, so you know, how does it compete in the marketplace? Why is it better than what's commercially available right now in the marketplace? that sort of answers the question about what is your value proposition? Why is this better than what's on the market? We like to know kind of how far along you are. What is your experimental findings and support so far? This is a proof of concept plan, which means that we don't expect that you have all the answers or that you know everything about your um, technology or if it will it's indeed work as you envision it. But um, we like to know where you are with your experimental findings and what support you uh, you have for your idea. What needs to happen next to better prepare your technology? So what, what do you envision if you would receive the funding of the QED award, how would you use that to uh, prove out your technology and you know, what would that look like? Again, the key factors for selection, it has to be your technology um, can be of any therapeutic, biologic, um, device, diagnostic, um, digital even. Um, we, we actually see dental technologies and uh, veterinarian technologies as well. So it's very wide open for all kinds of uh, technologies that improve the quality of, of life or the current standard of care in the market. The scientific merit and potential intellectual property position is something that we, we look at. And when I say potential IP, again, we don't you don't have to have a patent. It's always great if you have had some kind of filing because uh, technologies do form around IP, and that's that's really what will be needed in the marketplace. I, we see a lot of digital-based technologies, and the difficulty with them is patentable, maybe, but not very protectable. So it's it's you know it's an idea to say how crowded would that IP field look like. So, but again, having a, a patent is not necessary, but is also what is what is looked at, and uh, you can work with your uh, tech transfer officer on that.
So the probability of attracting follow-on funding, another big uh, thing that we look at is to say, would this be of interest to investors? Would this be in, in, of interest to companies that would want to acquire the technology? Um, and of course, the support from the tech transfer office is always uh, necessary for each of the projects going through QED. Uh, to be eligible, um, you have to be, uh, Penn is a participating institution of the QED program. Not all institutions are. Uh, most of the ones in the Philadelphia region are. Um, your technology has to be life care or uh, healthcare or life science focused. You have to be able to devote um, up to about five hours a week for um, eight weeks of QED program year to participate in meetings and to help produce your proof of concept uh, plan, which is actually your plant. So it's, it's really on the researcher to be able to devote that time to be doing that. Another big factor is a willingness to learn and an interest in the commercialization process and interest in moving your technology towards the marketplace. The IP has to be unlicensed and controlled still by the university. And uh, we we're gonna talk about uh, the uh, matching funds which have to be included. Uh, uh, you know, so that we know that you're able to make that match. Research that you're doing is substantially performed at the participating institution. So we do look at projects that are um, uh, co-developed, say, uh, we just had one this last round that was co-developed by Penn and by CHOP. You know, there's a lot of uh, overlapping programs there. Uh, that's certainly fine, um, but uh, that there must be a substantial amount of work done at the institution. What we don't like to see is the funds are given to Penn, but all the work is being done uh, in California, something like that. So that that's not... Um, and we can look at those on an individual basis if there's any questions on those. Let's talk a little bit about the matching funds. We provide the business advisors, the mentorship, the specialized services like research uh, regulatory specialists and intellectual property specialists, um, reimbursement specialists. So uh, those are those are all that is given, and, and then the award is announced, and then it's shared with the um, with the university. There's, there's three different ways to do that. These are taken from, uh, this, this, these slides are taken from frequently asked questions that I would certainly make available, but the matching funds should be received from uh, one or more internal or external sources. So what we're saying is that the award amount is, is $200,000. So you have to say where that $100,000 of in-kind, usually in-kind contribution is. So it's going to be in-kind in the form of uh, committed salaries, fringe benefits, or other expenses that um, that you'll be able to say this is where you can do that. And from Penn's point of view, to be able to say that those matching funds are from another grant that you have, you, you have received another grant, um, and those that grant can be started as early as six to eight months prior to the start of the QED award, as long as the funds that you're using as match are um, are the are to advance that that technology and the focus of the QED project. The other ways to go through that is that the difference between the FNA cost paid by the Science Center, which is capped at five percent of direct cost, usually ten thousand dollars, then uh, and Penn's actual FNA costs, which is sixty five percent, or any combination, which is. Um, also includes the A, B, or C. PCI, nor does like the provost's office have matching funds to give you or give someone. So that kind of needs to um, come from your own set of resources. And that's kind of caused confusion in the past. We're happy, obviously, to help every step of the way. And we can look at, provide examples of folks and how they've come up with matching funds in the past, just there's not a source at the university to provide the matching funds that we're aware of. If you have a source, please use it. How did you, how do you define academic research team? It could be a postdoc. It could, it could be, you don't have to be the lead of the lab if that's what you're asking. It can be one individual. It doesn't have to be a team at that point. I mean, a lot of the technologies we have, we see, you know, that there are two or three people working on that project and that's fine. You just pick a co-lead or you can be a lead. Um, we can have co-leads, um, but uh, it, it's open to um, all levels of the university. And then another question is, does the QED program apply to op entrepreneurs who are not associated with any university and building something on our own? 
Probably not then. These are the participating institutions that are part of, of QED. So the intellectual property must be with one of these. Uh, the Science Center's agreement for QED is actually with the tech transfer office of these participating institutions. I say institutions because we have things like Wistar and Children's Hospital, which again, is not a university, but for the most part, a university. So uh, if the technology is already left the university or is not associated with any of these uh, partners, then it's not a fit for the, Q for the QED program. It may be a fit for a science center and some other program, but not for this program. Okay. This is Mike Dishowitz. Thanks, uh, Mike, for, for turning in. Yep. I just have a quick question about the matching funds as well. Overhead for indirect costs per pen, it's something like 60% or a little bit more than that. Um, so the Science Center, are you saying the Science Center will only pay 5% of that? So the rest of it, the department or the school that the faculty members are part of, they have to get their school to agree not to require those extra FNA costs? So, right. So it's being, so the way the QED program works, we, as, a, as you as a participating institution, you've agreed you know, to the QED program, you've agreed to these uh, matching funds and the overhead forgiveness uh, and revenue sharing as far as, as your part, the, this, the university's part of any agreements that may, per, may come out of the um, QED program. Um, so the, yeah, so the overhead forgiveness, it works out that we're saying it's capped at 10%. So that's on, on $200,000, that's $10,000. Um, um, and yeah, most of the schools will forego the FNA rate because of the fact that you're getting all the mentorship, you're getting all of the access to um, the specialists that we, other benefits of the, of the QED program. Okay, all right, that just helps uh, for us so that we know to direct faculty first to their department in their school to get that approval before they, they submit. I, I think one thing about the, the QED program is that, um, you know, you'll need, if, if that's what a requirement is for Penn to show that you'll be able to match those costs, um, then, you know, we can, we can try to help with that however you, you know, we can. We have a pro forma um, budget page that you can kind of work out in advance. Um, and, um, you know, if that helps to be able to show what, you know, where that might come from or how that would work. Um, just at, at the, you know, at Penn, uh, the, the FNA, it, it goes to, it's managed by the, the schools themselves. So oh, okay. Just okay. Need to, yeah, it's, it, it's not a, a PCI thing. Um, so we would just we just want to know how best to um, advise our faculty. So I just want to kind of talk about what does the program year look like or what does the program look like? So right now we're in the application phase where we're looking to uh, interest faculty members to uh, come into the program. There is a three-page non-confidential preliminary application that asks those questions that I that I outlined earlier about you know the market and and how the, how is, how does it uh, how is it better than uh, what's on the market currently? Um, that application gets submitted to us via your tech transfer office. And the reason we have that done that way is that there's uh, we want to make sure that. Uh, if there is going to be any IP put into place that the tech transfer office has the uh, opportunity to look at that and want, if, they're, if they want to do anything further than that. Um, we call it non-confidential and it, and it, I mean, it should, you should not submit anything confidential, but we don't do, we don't, we would never publish that or we don't, that doesn't go to, uh, doesn't go outside the QED program um, stakeholders. And by that, I mean that um, a copy of it, the application goes to the selection team so that they can make the decisions about which of those, of, of from all the applications we receive, which is about usually between 30 and 50 applications, we, we select a cohort of between 10 and 12 finalists from that. Um, and so of course the, the selection team needs to be able to review those applications. Um, and then from there, we have a matching for those 10 to 12 finalists, they receive two business advisors. Um, and those two business advisors, then again, of course, are going to be able to see the application and they actually get to see uh, a short presentation by the 10 to 12 uh, finalist projects so that we are matching the right business advisors. These business advisors have a long history of it, working in industry. They're, they are um, usually cons consultants or people that have had a long time in, in their field and they're able to guide uh, the technologies 
uh, going forward because they have a good understanding of what is necessarily needed for those, those technologies. We also then, um, once we get established we, with the two business advisors, there's also a student fellow. Um, and a student fellow is a grad student or a um, postdoc in any of the universities that we work with. And they are really great at helping to be more like the um, uh, assistant to the to the project, and uh, because the team is you know is from very different sources, there's the university uh, researcher and his team, and then the business advisors. Um, the student fellow as often acts as the sort of uh, admin, if you will, for this for the team, and uh, and is directed by the business advisors on what kinds of things that we that. How to, how to help, and that those are usually done in terms of trying to get good market data and good trying to figure out the marketplace or you know, what should be done. Student fellows are really good at being able to kind of provide those kinds of assistance. Um, sometimes there's up to two business that, uh, student fellows that are on the team as well. And then you get to meet one-on-one -on -one with uh, regulatory and legal advisors. Um, all of, and I may wanna say that all of the people, uh, once you become a finalist, the mentors, the student fellow, the regulatory and legal uh, uh, advisors are all under uh, non-disclosure agreements. So uh, from once your application is done uh, or sent in, uh, if you're accepted as a finalist, no one sees your proof of concept plan except for people that have, had, um, that have signed a confidentiality agreement. You're developing this proof of concept plan, and I can go into a little bit more about what's included in the proof of concept plan, but it, it's, um, it's basically very market focused. It's a roadmap for the next three to five years as to uh, what is your technology going to need in terms of further experiments, but also, you know, what is the regulatory pathway for the next three to five years? What's, you know, what are you going to look at in terms of intellectual property or what will need to be looked at there? Um, is you know how crowded is the field? Do you have freedom to operate? Those kinds of things, um, and there's also a lot of a lot of really uh, good advice is given to build that proof of concept plan. At the end of the year, a proof uh, presentation is given by the PEI on their proof of concept plan to that same selection team. Same same select, selection team decides which of the techno of three of the finalist projects, up to three of them are awarded that $200,000. And then the award year starts uh, January of, in this case, January 2022. Uh, um, and uh, uh, you've got 12 months then to basically prove out what you put in that proof of concept plan. Benefits of participating in the QED program. So when you've gone through this program, you've got this proof of concept plan, which is really the basis for you to get um, lots of other funding. It's really helpful because it helps you look at your technology in terms of what does the market need rather than what do you have, what have you, what are you producing or what are you experimenting on, but what's the need in the marketplace and what will be the need in the marketplace. And, and to look at your technology in terms of market is really a great benefit to be able to get other follow-on funding. You've got this customized men mentorship. Um, your uh, IP is retained by the institution. The Science Center does not take possession of any uh, technologies. We don't own anything, you know, it's still your technology, still owned by the university, still, still yours. Um, it's not, it's not at all ours. We're just here to help. We also give you exposure to uh, the investment community and uh, gives you a lot of industry contacts that you would have to move your technology forward. So, and again, that the proof of concept plan is there to help you if you're going to be start doing a startup, if you're going to be licensing it, uh, whatever your, um, path towards commercialization would be uh, it's it's there to help you get get where you need to go. To give you some idea of the impact of the QED program since its inception in 2009, we've had over 720 technologies submit uh, to the program. 150 projects were selected into the program uh, to receive advisory support. So uh, 44 of those were awarded the funding of up to $200,000 for their 12 month proof of concept. Uh, 14 of those uh, projects have been licensed. Um, 10 with startups, and over $32 million of follow-on funding was leveraged by those same projects for them to be able, to the awarded projects, for them to be able to um, get additional funding for their projects. Um, a lot of the QED awardees uh, or finalists say to me, you know, I wouldn't have 
gone into QED if, uh, except I, I thought there was going to be funding at the end, but even going through the program, I have learned so much. I have gotten so much out of the program because I have now made all these contacts. I now understand how to present my technology in terms of the marketplace. Um, and um, even though I wasn't awarded the money, I am really happy with the time I've spent within QED. All of these institutions have signed the exact same participation agreement to be part of QED. Uh, here's some of the some of the licensed projects uh, we've done. This one from Penn is uh, one from Jake Brenner, a wearable vest that relieves shortness of breath for COPD patients. Um, and I think we've got uh, uh, polyarum, which I think is uh, one of, that's the last one listed there, uh, radio labeling with gold nanoparticles. So. Um, We've had many other technologies come through from Penn in the program, and uh, this is just to kind of give an overview of some of the projects that we've done. Thank you, Sharon.